Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning, dear students. This is lecture number 7. In this lecture, we will be studying two prominent acts passed by the British Parliament relating to Indian affairs. The first act was passed by the British government in 1773. It was regulating act and the second act came into known as Pitsindia Act. These two acts will be studied in this lecture. First of all, we will be looking at the circumstances behind the passage of the Regulating Act. What were the reasons behind the passage of the Regulating Act? In the previous lecture, we have seen that after the battles of Plassey and Bexar, the British established their administration in Bengal. In 1765, the governor Robert Clive, he introduced a system of government in Bengal. It came into known as dual government. This came into known as dual government. Under this system of dual government, the British were engaged in the collection of land revenue or Diwani from Bengal, Bihar and Orissa. The British got this right through the Treaty of Allahabad. We studied in previous class. Through the Treaty of Alagabad, the British got the Diwani rights of Bengal, Bihar and Orissa from Mughal Emperor Shah Alam II. The British who enjoyed Diwani rights in Bengal, Bihar and Orissa and they collected revenues. But the right of administration was the responsibility of Nawab, Bengal Nawab. It came in known as Nisamud Pavets. But these two Pavets, Robert Clive split into two. One, Divani means collection of land revenue. Nisamud. Nisamud means administration, maintenance of land order. Maintenance of land order was the responsibility of the Bengal Nawab. Why? While the land tax was collected by the British. This system of government came into known as dual government. This system was operational in Bengal from 1765 to 1772. What was the effect of this dual system of government introduced in Bengal by Robert Clive? These revenue collectives who did not give any interest to the welfare of the people. It was the sole responsibility of the Nawab. The English concentrated only on the collection of land revenue. They used it to collect tax by using oppressive methods. The tax was fixed so high so that it could be collected by using oppressive methods. Because of the exploitation of the peasants through the excessive collection of land tax, famine visited Bengal in 1770. Lacks of 
persons were died in this great famine of Bengal of 1770. The British government did not take any concrete famine relief measures leading to heavy toll of life in Bengal. It was one of the most appealing disasters of the recorded history of India. One thing we have to keep in mind is that the English East India Company was not directly responsible for the disasters in Bengal, but the officials and the agents of the company were mainly responsible for this disaster in Bengal. The servants of the English East India Company amassed huge wealth at the cost of the company. They went back to England with immense wealth collected from Bengal. This wealth was not collected through plunder. It was through the plunder, this immense wealth of Bengal was collected by these officials and went to England. While these officials of the English East India Company were making huge profits and sending this wealth to England, what was the condition of the English East India Company? It was on the verge of insolvency. It always remain in debt. While the company officials were getting wealthier, the condition of the English East India Company was on debt. In 1769, the debt of the English East India Company was calculated at 6 million British pounds. Following this debt, the company declared 12.5 percent of its dividend for sale. The directors of this company, in one of the previous decades, we have seen that the affairs of the English East India Company was managed by a court of directors consisting of 24 members. These directors who were in charge of the English East India Company concealed these facts and they used to falsify these accounts. However, the directors of the company concealed and falsified the accounts. The original position of the English East India Company spread in Britain. During this circumstance, English East India Company applied to the Bank of England a loan for 10 lakh British pound in the verge of debt. By applying for a loan to the tune of 10 lakh British pound, they signed the death warrant of company's independence. It was going to be taken over by British government. Lord North, he was then the British Prime Minister. He referred the request made by English East India Company for a loan to the tune of 10 lakh Great British Pound to both the Houses of Parliament, House of Lords and House of Commons. This Parliament appointed a select committee to make a detailed study and a report on the Parliament. The select committee was presided over by General Bargoini, who presided over this select committee appointed by the British Parliament to 
to study the application submitted by English East India Company for a grant of loan to the tune of 10 lakh Great British Pounds. While the select committee was doing study, another declaration of dividend was made by English East India Company. Again, 12.5 percent was declared in 1772 August. Again, due to heavy indebtedness, the English East India Company applied for another loan. It was also to the tune of 10 lakh British pound. Following which, the House of Commons, the lower house of the British Parliament, appointed a second committee to investigate the reasons for it. Why did the company was always on the verge of indebtedness, while the officials of the English East India Company were returning to Britain with immense wealth from Bengal. This committee began to investigate the reasons behind it. In 1773, these two committees appointed by the British Parliament submitted its report. Based on the report submitted by these two select committees, Two bills were drafted and piloted in the British Parliament. These two bills passed into Act in 1773. Two Acts were passed. Under the first Act, passed in 1773, it granted the company a loan of 14 lakh British pound at a 4 percent interest. Two acts were passed. The first act granted a loan to the tune of 14 lakh British pound at the rate of 4 percent interest. What was the second act? It was none other than the regulating act. From the very nomenclature, regulate, this act was passed by the British parliament to regulate the affairs of the English East India Company and the government in India. This was the first constitutional enactment. The first constitutional enactment regulating act was the first constitutional enactment made by the British Parliament on Indian affairs. The regulating act was passed with resistance from different courts whose interest began to be affected with the passage of this regulating act. No doubt the company interest began to be going to affect with the passage of the regulating act. So, the managers of the company opposite the passage of the regulating act. Now, we are looking at the major provisions of the regulating act. This was the first act passed by the British parliament relating to Indian affairs. The act remodeled the constitution of English East India Company both in England and in India. First of all, let us look what changes it brought in home government in Britain. In Britain, the right to vote in the court of proprietors, the shareholders who enjoyed the vote of right, the vote of right was raised from 500 pound to 1000 pound. 
it provided that the court of directors the court of directors consisted of 24 members they were elected by the shareholders or the court of proprietors on an annual ground but now it began to change this court of directors they were elected annually by the shareholders or the court of proprietors those who had paid 500 great british pounds now major changes made in it one the voting right would be given to only those who held the share of 1000 british pound and above and earlier the court of directors was annually elected but now this practice came to an end henceforth it would be elected for a period of 4 years the number of directors was fixed at 24 there would have been 24 directors in the court of directors but one fourth used to retire at the regular interval of 1 year the court of directors were required to lay before the treasury all correspondences dealing with the revenue with this regulating act the british government tried to regulate the affairs of the english east india company initially the court of directors were required to lay before the treasury all correspondences dealing with revenue from india secondly they were required before the secretary of state nearest analogy of the external affairs minister secretary of state all matters relating to civil and military administration thus it was for the first time the british cabinet got the right to control indian affairs by giving the secretary of state the right to deal with the civil and military administration relating to indian affairs these were the major changes introduced in brit home government in britain the major changes were the number of court of directors was fixed at 24 and they would be elected for a period of 4 years but one fourth would be retiring each year these were the major changes introduced at home government in britain now we are looking at the major changes introduced in india in india a collegiate government was introduced collegiate government means that governed there would be a governor general and a four members there would have been a council consisting of four members it came into known as collegiate government all decisions in the council would be made based on majority simple majority the governor general would have only a casting out in case of a tie if the two members in the council ranged on one side and another two members ranged on another side only in that case the governor general would enjoy the right to vote three members of the council formed a quorum in all meetings there was a need of three members the name of governor general as well as the members were mentioned in the act itself warren hastings was the first governor general mentioned in the regulate his name was mentioned in the regulating act itself who were the members of the council the members of the council 
were to be Philip Francis, Clavering, Monson and Barbell. They were to be the members of the Council of the Governor General. This system of government came into known as collegiate system. The, their tenure was 5 years. They would remain in office for 5 years. They could be removed by the British Crown based on the recommendation tendered by Court of Directors. However, the name of the Governor General and the members of the Governor General in Council mentioned in the Regulating Act, in the Act itself, it was made clear that future appointments were to be made by the English East India Company to the post of Governor General and members in the Council of the Governor General would be made by the English East India Company. What type of powers these collegiate government vested with? They were given the civil and military government of the presidency of Fort William in Bengal. Civil and military affairs of the Fort William were handed over this collegiate government. In addition to that, they were required to superintendence the subordinate presidencies of Madras and Bombay in certain matters. In what matters was not clear. Only on certain matters this was mentioned in this act. Supreme Court. The act empowered the British Crown to establish a Supreme Court at Calcutta. The Supreme Court would consist of a Chief Justice and three brother judges. All public servants of the English East India Company were to be under the jurisdictional powers of the Supreme Court. All the British subjects, European and Indian would seek redress of the grievances in the Supreme Court. It would also entertain complaints against the servants of the English East India Company. Earlier, there had no provision for complaining against the officials of the English East India Company. It was for the first time a provision was made under which anybody could complain against the officials of the English East India Company. It got both original and appellate jurisdiction. Original jurisdiction means that this case originates in this court. Appellate means appeals from subordinate courts. Following the English custom or cases were heard with the help of a jury. Based on this, the Supreme Court was created in Calcutta in 1774. Ilija Imbe was the first Chief Justice of this Supreme Court created at Calcutta in 1774. Who were the remaining brother judges? Chambers, Lemaster, Hyde. They were the brother judges appointed to the Supreme Court at Calcutta. The act also made provision for the principle of honest administration. For this purpose, a provision was included in this act. What was this provision? No person exercising any civil or military office under the British Crown shall accept, receive or directly or indirectly any present gift, donation, creativity or otherwise, which was for the first time the act regulated 
the officials from taking presents and gifts. In this act itself, liberal salaries were provided to the Governor General, members in the Governor's General Council, Chief Justice as well as the brother judges. Governor General would be provided 25,000 British pounds annually. All these salaries were to be given on an annual basis, not a monthly basis. Members of the Governor General Council would be given 10,000 British pounds annually. Chief Justice would be given 8,000 British pounds annually. What about the brother judges who would be given 6,000 British pounds annually? These were the salaries, these were mentioned in this act itself. Now we are going to make an assessment of the regulating act. No doubt it was the first attempt by the British government to regulate the affairs of the English East India Company and following which this act was passed. This act appointed as we have seen a governor general but he was not in a position to function properly. What did create the improper functioning of the collegiate government? Governor General was reduced to a powerless. As we have seen that all the decisions in the council of the Governor General would be taken based on simple majority. But if we take the period spanning between 1774 and 1776, Warren Hastings was uniformly outvoted in this council. The Governor General could not override the majority decisions taken in the Council of the Governor General. The Governor General could act only based on the majority of opinion. So, the interest of the Governor General was suppressed. Now, as we have seen, the act established a Supreme Court at Calcutta. But in this act, it did not define the field of jurisdiction. What would be the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court? Which matters would taken into account? And the jurisdictional powers of Governor General's Council and the Supreme Court was not demarcated. It brought more often than not conflict between the Supreme Court and the Governor General in Council. There what it have been a demarcation of powers between the Supreme Court and the Governor General in Council. But there was no provision in the Act for demarcating the powers between the Supreme Court and the Governor General in Council. Another mistake in the Act was that there was no mention of which law would the Supreme Court administer. Whether it was to administer the English law or the Muhammadan's law or the personal law of the concerned parties. There was no mention of the laws the Supreme Court would administer. It was mentioned that there was no demarcation of jurisdictional powers between the Supreme Court and the Governor General in Council. From a close analysis of the Act, it was clear that this Act never tried to assert the sovereignty of the British Crown or the titular authority of the Nawab of Bengal. 
it did not openly assert or this act did not make any effort to encroach upon the powers of the British Crown or the Nawab of Bengal. This act did not give the British government a definite control over the English East India Company. This act failed to give a definite control to the British government over the affairs of the English East India Company. Likewise, this act failed to give a definite control to directors over his servants. The directors were not given a definite control over the servants of the English East India Company. Likewise, as we have seen earlier, the Governor General was not given a definite control over his council because all decisions in the council were taken based on majority vote. Nor the Calcutta Presidency over the subordinate presidencies of Madras and Bombay. There was only a mention in the act that it would superintendence the subordinate presidencies of Bombay and Madras. There was no clear definition on what kind of superintendence and in what matters they would superintendence. These matters were not clear in this act itself. From a close scrutiny of the regulating act, it became clear that this act was based on the theory of checks and balances. It did not allow the governor general to assume a supreme power because he was controlled by the council. All decisions were taken based on the majority vote. But once the act was put into operation, it was began to face difficulties due to its own inherent weakness. An unworkable situation was arisen between the Governor General and the members of the Council of the Governor General. Because the Governor General enjoyed only a casting out, he had to respect the majority opinion in the Council. Again, two different types of laws were administered in the same country. The Supreme Court created in Calcutta mostly administered based on English laws, but the country courts administered the justice based on personal laws. Muhammadan laws were used in the administration of criminal system. Personal laws were taken into account by the country courts, but the Supreme Court administered based on English laws. The council and court ranged on two hostile camp. As you have been told earlier that there was no demarcation of power between the Supreme Court and the Governor General in council. It made the Supreme Court and the Governor General in council to hostile camp. If the laws passed by the Governor General in Council was not taken into account by the Supreme Court. There was no other option. Then this act did not give an effective control to Governor General on subordinate presidencies of Bombay and Madras. So, because of all this, the system broke down when it was made operational in India. Now, 
we are looking at the importance of the act as you have been told that it was the first constitutional enactment made by the british parliament relating to indian affairs and it was also the first attempt to regulate the affairs of a far off country inhabited by a civilized people the act no doubt to organize an honest and efficient administration in india in bengal madras and bombay it tried to introduce an efficient and honest administration but because of the weight the regulating act was bro broken under its own weight it was for the first time it established a supreme court in calcutta it was for the first time the english servants were made responsible and accountable to the court for the acts done by them the act totally tried to introduce an efficient system of administration in india now coming to the second act passed by the british parliament relating to indian affairs this came in known as amending act of 1781 this amending act was passed in 1781 to correct the defects of the regulating act certain changes were introduced in this regulating act through the passage of the amending act what changes did introduce through this amending act first the actions done by the officials of the english east india company in their official capacity for the official purpose exempted from the jurisdiction of the supreme court at calcutta the court now was not in a position to make an official of the english east india company for the actions done in their official capacity now as you have been told earlier there was no line of demarcation between the powers of the supreme court and the governor general in council with the passage of the amend act this issue was resolved then jurisdictional powers the jurisdictional powers of the supreme court was made clear through the passage of the amending act it would have jurisdiction on all inhabitants of calcutta whether it was french or dutch or europeans or indians secondly it was to administer the personal law of the defendant this explanation was found absent in this regulating act but now it became clear which law the supreme court was to administer the personal law of the defendant was it to be administered and it would have jurisdictional powers over all inhabitants of calcutta again in the amending act a provision was made that religious and social customs of the indian should be respected while enforcing the decrees then another provision included in the amending act was with regard to the appeals appeals could be taken from the provincial courts to the governor general in council only this provision was available only in civil cases which involved up to sum of 5000 great british pounds 
the old civil cases of 5000 pound and above to whom the appeal was to be given kings in council in all cases all civil cases of above 5000 pound and above appeal should be given to kings in council it would act as the highest court of appeal the another change introduced through this amending act was that it was not necessary for the supreme court to register the rules and regulations made by the governor general in council earlier the supreme court used to publish the rules and regulations made by the governor general in council with this with the passage of the amending act this practice came to an end what was the reason behind the publication of these rules and regulations or the registration of these rules and regulations the supreme court reviewed the legality of these rules and regulations made by the governor general in council and after which it registered now there was no need for evaluating the rules and regulations passed by the governor general in council and pronounce its legality these were the major changes introduced through the amending act of 1781 now we are going to analyze the next act pitts india act william pitt during the period of william pitt as the prime minister this act was introduced that is why this act came to be known as william pitt it was william pitt who initially introduced this in this british parliament later he became the british prime minister and it was brought into statute book this pitts india act mainly brought the changes in the home government in britain what changes did pitts india act brought it increased the control of the government on english east india company as you have been told earlier through the regulating act it did not give a definite control to the british government on english east india company but through the pitts india act british parliament gave a definite control to british government on the affairs of the english east india company now we are going to look how on in what matter did the british government control the affairs of the english east india company first of all all civil military and revenue affairs of the company were to be controlled by a board popularly known as board of control a board of control was created this board of control would control all civil military and revenue affairs of the english east india company the board of control would consist of chancellor of the exchequer that is a finance minister one of the principal secretaries of the state and four members of the privy council appointed by the british king it was for the first time the british government assumed definite control over the affairs of the english east india company through the creation of board of control which began to control our civil military and revenue affairs of the english east india company in addition to that there would be a secret committee consisting of three directors this secret committee would function as an intermediary 
through which important orders of the board of control were to be transmitted to india it acted as an intermediary between the board of control and the authorities in india the court of proprietors they were the shareholders of the english east india company they had earlier enjoyed to suspend or revoke resolutions of the directors but now this right of the court of proprietors took away the court of proprietors was no longer able to suspend or revoke a resolution of the directors approved by the board of control certain changes were also made in india as well in in, in india the chief change made was that the chief government was placed in the hands of governor general and the council earlier through the regulating act the number of members in the governor general council was 4 now it was reduced to 3 as we have seen that most of the time the members of the governor general council used to outvote the governor general he was only in a position to act according to the majority decisions taken in the council so in order to give a relief to the governor general in council the number of members in the governor general in council was reduced to 3 from 4 however the decisions were to be taken on majority but the number of councillors was reduced to 3 if, if it gave a some kind of relief to the governor general on the count that if one of the members in the council supported the decision of the governor general it would come into effect of the three members one should be a commander in chief of the rv for the major change introduced in india was that the number of members in the governor general council was reduced to 3 of the three members one should be the commander in chief of the army it gave a slight slight relief to the governor general if he had mustered the support of one member his decisions would come into effect this pits in the act also modified the councils of bombay and madras on the pattern of bengal governors council were created in bombay and madras it also prohibited aggressive wars in india this act was passed in 1784 but this act prohibit prohibited any kind of aggressive wars but this period that is from 1784 to 1799 aggressive wars broke out in india initially between tipu sultan and the british aggressive wars took place between tipu sultan and british in 1792 and in 1799 and later the british engaged in fierce battle with marathas likewise the governor general enjoyed only a casting out in case of a tie as you have been told earlier if the governor general had one supporter by using his casting out he was 
able to put in the effect his decisions. Another change introduced through the Speech India Act of 1784 was that the subordinate presidencies of Bombay and Madras were truly subordinated the Governor General in all matters of diplomacy, revenue and war. The subordinate presidencies could not engage in war or enter into treaties with any other power without prior permission from the Governor General. So, it commenced the centralization of power. Power began to concentrate into the Supreme Government at Calcutta. Another change introduced through this act was that only covenanted servants, civil servants, higher civil service, uncovenanted civil servants were not appointed as the members of the Council of the Governor General. Only the covenanted civil servants were appointed as the members of the Council of the Governor General. Still, the Court of Directors retained their patronage. Patronage here means that those who enjoyed the patronage of the Court of Directors got appointment into covenanted and uncovenanted civil posters and offices of the English East India Company. This patronage still the court of directors retained. Now coming into the observation of the Pitts India Act, as we have seen, it was for the first time the control of the British government became wide and powerful with the creation of the board of control which controlled all civil, military and revenue affairs of the English East India Company. One of the main defects of the Pitts India Act was that it created a dual system of government. One by the company that is the court of directors. The shareholders of the company enjoyed the right to vote, who in turn elected the court of directors. Court of directors would be considered as the agents of the English East India Company. And secondly, the parliamentary board that is the board of control. This system continued. 1858 till the passage of another act in 1858. While the court of directors enjoyed patronage, the board of control did not have any kind of patronage, nor did they enjoy any executive power. The board of control had access to all the papers of the English East India Company relating to military, revenue and diplomatic affairs of the English East India Company. And the prior approval of the board of control was necessary for all dispatches relating to commercial civil and military affairs or the board of control was necessary. Initially the board of control approved all dispatches relating to civil, military and commercial affairs of the company. What do you understand from this? From the creation of board of control, we come in to know that the English East India Company was placed under the subordination of British government 
in civil and military matters. In 1786, another act was passed by the British Parliament. This act was passed to make Lord Cornwallis as the Governor General as well as the Commander in Chief at the same time. With this intention, this act was passed in 1786 in British Parliament. In addition to that, this act empowered Lord Cornwallis to override the decisions taken in the Council in extraordinary cases. But this act of 1786 made Cornwallis the Governor General as well as the Commander in Chief and he could also override the majority decisions taken in the Council in case of extraordinary circumstance. Now coming into the major questions circumstances behind the passage of the Regulating Act, main provisions of the Regulating Act, main provisions of Pitt India Act, who was the first Governor General, name the first Chief Justice, their names were mentioned in this Act itself, who were the members of the Governor General. Thank you dear students for watching this class. Thank you. Hello and welcome to this piece of literary snippet. We usually know William Shakespeare as the most revered figure in the history of English literature. But we often tend to forget that he has also been one of the most hated figures in literature. And here I am not talking only about those boys and girls who have to memorize uh, long sections from Macbeth or King Lear or Julius Caesar uh, before they can go and sit for their school and, or college exams. But I am also talking about people who are themselves quite famous authors. Tolstoy, for instance, considered the writings of Shakespeare to be, and I quote, crude, immoral, vulgar and senseless. George Bernard Shaw absolutely loathed Shakespeare as he did Homer. But perhaps no other criticism about Shakespeare is more damaging than the one which says that Shakespeare is a marvelous storyteller, provided someone has told him the story earlier. Now, this piece of criticism is particularly damaging because it is true. None of Shakespeare's plays contain any original story whatsoever. They are all written using pre-existing materials, pre-existing stories. Now, does that diminish the stature of Shakespeare as a dramatic I'll leave that for you to decide in the next episode of Literary Snippets. <laughs>